Merry Christmas here in Hampton Roads. You know, it's a great day. It's a day in which families are with each other. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ and all individuals as merry and joy. Well, you know, Christmas has evolved in our community over hundreds of years. And we're going to talk about the meaning of Christmas today. It's Day the One. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. We'll be back in just a moment. Once again, thank you so much for joining us here on Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Clavel. Again, we want to wish all of you a merry, merry Christmas. I mean, this is, what, the most joyous time of the year. And, you know, it falls on a Sunday, which couldn't be probably even more perfect for, you know, everyone. I know a lot of persons are in church and a lot of uh, celebrations are taking place. Kids are opening gifts and and all of that. And we want to thank you for joining us here and just taking time out of your schedule to join us here on Stay the Water. You know, you know, as we have here with us always in studio, our producer of the show, Marvin Folks, also known as DJ Scandalous, uh, keeping us right and tight. And as always, which you can hear on this station every day from 2 to 6 p.m. on Saturday and yes, on Sunday as well, the hardest working man in radio. You know, we were just talking about this joyous time of the year and how, you know, things are, are it's kind of, kind of crispy outside, kind of cold. Uh, but at the same time, you know, just the memories that we have for Christmas, you know, and uh, we're going to talk about, you know, what does Christmas really mean to us? So we're really excited about the show today. But as always, I like to thank you, the listeners and the greatest alumni and supporters of the Spartan Nation, because without you, we really couldn't do what we do. So we want to thank all of you for all your support that you've given us throughout the years and what we do here, because, again, This is, you know, the people's station. And again, we're broadcasting live, as we always do, from the greatest university, the greatest HBCU in the country. That's right. That's the Norfolk State University here at WNSB, the soul of VA Hot 91. So, you know, as we talk about, you know, Christmas, as we talk about reminiscing on what Christmas is, You know, I think about how Christmas has really evolved over the years, especially here in in the black community. You know, I think about, you know, my my mother, you know, cooking pies and and cakes. I think about us running around the kitchen and the house full and my father coming in from work and, and, you know, just, you know, anticipating the gifts under the tree and, and, of course, going out. You know, we had church services on uh, on Christmas Day as well, uh, but also going out and giving gifts and and making sure that that one day, you know, people were at least experienced some type of joy and happiness. You know, but with that, you know, Christmas has meant so many different things, you know, of across the country, across the world, really, and especially in the black community. And here to help us talk about, you know, the evolution of Christmas and really the meaning of Christmas, especially in the black community we have with us, uh, who's no stranger to Norfolk State University, no stranger to WNSB, and no strangers to many out there listening. But that's none other than Dr. Cassandra newby Alexander, the new endowed professor of Virginia black history and culture. Cassandra, how are you doing today? Merry Christmas I'm to you. I'm <laughs> doing fine. Thank you so much. And, and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everyone listening. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those days that's, that's very special, you know, very special to, you know, many of us and, and really everyone in the world, you know, not just the meaning behind it, of course, celebrating the birth of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, uh, where it was birthed out of, uh, but also a time for family, a time to be together and, you know, a time to just just sit back and really in, and take a exhale from the end of the year. I don't know about you, but how was 2022 for you? 
has been extremely busy, but um, I would say full of some incredible um, events, uh, surprises, opportunities um and you know and i'm i'm just thankful that uh even though covid is still a problem even though uh the flu is annually a problem as well as other respiratory illnesses um i'm just so thankful that we have solutions that can at least stave off um, so many people dying from that, and that it, that includes these vaccines that are out there, masks to help us. And so, you know, I'm just very grateful for all of those things and encourage all, the, all of your listeners to just please make sure that you take care of yourself and you take care of your families because we only get, in many cases, one shot at this and... You know, this is a time of celebration, but we also have to be very careful and cautious and keep our loved ones safe and keep ourselves safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when we think about 2022 and really, I would say 2020 to 2022, two years, it seems like a blur. You know, of course, the world went through a major, you know, pandemic shutdown. You mentioned, you know, COVID-19, but also the just the stretching of resources and supply chain. But here we are, you know, God has really blessed all of us to make it to this, to this point. And, uh, you know, again, 2023 is looking up, but we're not quite there just yet. So we don't want, we don't want to move too fast, but, but, you know, before we go on, you know, I mentioned uh, your, your, your new title, you know, the newly endowed professor of, Virginia Black History and Culture. Tell our audience just a little bit about that before we get into the evolution and the meaning of Christmas in the black community. Well, you know, um, at a number of universities, they've had endowed professorships, or sometimes they call it endowed chairs. And this is usually funded in part or, or totally by foundation funds. Um, and they select a person whose work uh, has been of distinction. Um, and um, the president, our president, Dr. Adams Gaston, um, asked me to be the first at Norfolk Endow Professorship as well as to take on this particular title based on so much of my research and writing, you know, where I look at Virginia black history and culture. And I'm a historian by training, but I am also a historian that looks at society from a broad perspective. Uh, what John Blassingame uh, focused on when he wrote The Slave Community, he was a historian, but he looked at the total package, not just the history, but the culture as well, because through because of American society and how it did not uh, record, it did not try to preserve the activities, the um, um, engagements, the uh, progress, the lives of African Americans in so many ways. It was just focused for the most part on the white communities. What what helps us to understand and decipher and make sense of our history requires that we look at the total package, the culture, the evolution of language and culinary arts, the impact that we've had on American society, the way that white America has appropriated so many uh, aspects of our culture, claimed it as their own, but then when you take a deep dive into that, you see that this originated with people of African descent. And so that's what I do. So when I have written articles on 1619 and talking about the importance of, of Africans on this, this journey that they didn't agree to, they were forced to be on this journey taken from their homes in, in the Dong, from Ndongo, which is today Angola, and, and forcefully brought here to the Virginia shores, and then trying to make a life here in Virginia, especially in the Hampton Roads area. You know, I, I looked at the, 
the the cultural remnants. I looked at how they fought for their freedom, not only with their feet by running away, but also through the courts um, and through relationships that they would have with different individuals who were white as well as native. And, and how, while many of them did not succeed, some of them did, and what happened as a result, and the trajectory from that point even to today. And so the, the, the title that I have is really reflection of the work that I've done and continue to do. We're so excited about grants that we have. Uh, we're working on a project now through our Roberts Center called Soul Down River, in which we're, we're examining the 20,000-plus people who were taken from uh, the Hampton Roads area and shipped down to the Lower South as part of the domestic slave trade. And we're going to look at and see if we can find the descendants of those individuals. We now have the names of so many people from different records. And so my... my um, Work now is really focused on um, on on ensuring that this history is not only uh, revealed but it is publicized, and so through public programs, through publications, um, as well as through digital projects, um, that's what I'm I'm really tasked with doing and 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 if if there's any legacy it's going to be that the next generations have something to build on so that they can learn more about their past as a pathway to understanding who they are today the contributions of their ancestors and where they can go for the future absolutely you know i think of a well-deserved by the way and i think about the the great work that we've done together, starting with the Making of America conference back in 2015, and yes. uh, and all the way up to the Making of America summit here in Norfolk State uh, during the time of the commemoration, not celebration, yes. but commemoration of uh, <laughs> 400 years. I know a lot of people say celebration. Nah, we're commemorating. Yeah, we're not we're not celebrating for people being forced into a labor system that eventually became slavery, but we are commemorating um, who they were. They were human beings. Absolutely. They were, they had a, a life, a culture, a history, a heritage, and understanding that and understanding what they went through and what future generations coming from other parts of West and West Central Africa, what they endured and the legacies that they created. That's that's what we're commemorating, and it's an ongoing process. It didn't just stop in 2019. It, it, it's a journey that we're on. That's why there's a book called The African American Odyssey. You know, we are still on this journey, this journey of becoming, this journey of, of recognition, of of discovery, of rediscovery, um, and so the uh, my my new title and and what I am supposed to do is part and uh, is part of that ongoing effort. And and I'm building on the the work of people like Luther P. Jackson, who's a professor at Virginia State oh, yeah. uh, College at that time, but now university, who did some incredible work documenting the lives and the accomplishments of early African-American legislators uh, who served both at the local, state, and national levels, and also those who served in special offices like the sheriff's office or the tax um, collector's office. You know, they were in charge of all of these things, um, as well as recording the accomplishments of African Americans who served in the military, both in the Navy and Army during the American Revolution. So many people don't know that at least a fourth of the of the American forces at Yorktown were African American. Wow! <laughs> just look, just little golden nuggets like that helps you to. You know, rethink the definition of who is American, right? Absolutely. That's what 
what made Frederick Douglass so angry about, you know, when he wrote this this uh, speech, you know, uh, about what the Fourth of July means for Black Absolutely. people, and you know, he one also of the most powerful, commented. Powerful speeches. He's, he's, he, oh, he, wrote, he wrote a lot, but that was one of the most powerful. <laughs> I, you know, it is still relevant today. That's that's what is so amazing about people like Douglas and and uh, Harriet Tubman uh, and Sojourner Truth and Ella Jo Baker and just so many giants, is that the things that they said years ago, still relevant today. James Baldwin, his work that he wrote in the 1960s, looking at racism, looking at the challenges that African Americans are still facing, it was as if he wrote it yesterday. Because the issues are still there, and the issues are still there because there's still, you know, when we talk about racism, it, it is it is something that's baked into a culture, and it takes a long time to unbake it, to get it out. But then there has to be a willingness and an acknowledgement, first of all, that it exists, and a willingness to change. And American society has has really been resistant to changing those things. And that's why so many of the statements that people made 200 years ago are still relevant today because there's been such resistance. It's Stay the One. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Lavelle, and we want to wish you a Merry, Merry Christmas on this beautiful Sunday here in Hampton Rosen, wherever you're listening to us. It's a time of celebration, a time to recognize the birth of Jesus Christ, and a time to be with your families. Joining us here today, we have with us one of my good friends and also the newly, the newly endowed professor of, of black, of Virginia black history and culture, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. Uh, Cassandra, when we talk about Christmas, you know, we, you know, well, first of all, one thing about America, America, one of the, one of the major, major uh, uh, commodities of America is this culture. American culture exports everywhere. And, I, and my theory is that American culture is simply black culture with a white face, right? But we're not <laughs> going to get into that now. But, but you know, when we talk about American culture, you know, Christmas, of course, started hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But when we look at what Christmas represents from a commercialized standpoint, you look at the Santa Claus, you look at the reindeers, you have, you know, Santa Claus coming through chimneys. Everybody doesn't have a chimney. Putting gifts under the tree, you know, if you've been a good boy, a good girl, and the snow and so forth and so on. You know, but in the black community, you know, it's it, it has evolved into so many different things up to this point, including the evolution into Kwanzaa. Can you talk to us a little bit about, from a historical standpoint, you know, the meaning, the, the evolution, really, of Christmas in the black community? Sure. Uh, you know, you know, I'd like to start by just saying that in the general community, um, uh, a lot of people think of Christmas as forever being something that people celebrated, which it, it has not. Um, it really wasn't until the 19th century, so the 1800s, that you started to see actual Christmas celebrations. And, you know, the introduction of the tree, which, you know, came in part from Germany, that was something that um, was about in the 1830s. 1840s, that time period. Um, it wasn't a common practice, and for a lot of communities, they didn't actually want people to celebrate Christmas because they saw it as a pagan holiday. Mm. Because the reality is that, you know, based on the Bible, Christ was actually born in the summertime, not in the winter time, and certainly not in December. Um, and so what what these early Christian leaders in Europe did was they merged one of these holidays that celebrated nature that was, you know, the winter solstice. They merged that with the celebration of Christ's birth. And so so just the evolution of how we celebrate it, Christmas, and these things that are around that celebration, that evolved really from um, the 
uh, 1800s until now. And and each, you know, after the passing of so many generations, you have these additional things, including the Santa Claus with the white beard, you know, the... the <laughs> you know, obese man who, you know, gives presents and makes this journey around the world in, you know, in 24 hours. Um, and, and so that, that's, a, that's more of a, a mid-20th century idea. The, um, and, and some people um, still, in, especially in rural areas, still celebrate what they call Old Christmas. So when you think about the 12 days of Christmas, that song, um, the, you know, it's from Christmas Day all the way, you know, for the next 12 days. So each day you're giving uh, gifts to your family and to others, usually small gifts. Like one day you might give an orange or a bag of, of uh, nuts or, you know, uh, a li- you know, little ornaments for the tree or something like that. These are small little gifts. And, and so... When you're thinking about the, you know, singing the Twelve Days of Christmas, understand where that comes from. It's a, it's an old tradition that you know is really this sort of religious hybridity. You know, it's merged with some previous religious practices in Europe, and and so in the South, you still have people like people in my mother's generation who were born around the Great Depression. They still think about and practice when they were growing up, old Christmas. So many African Americans, when they think of Christmas, the first thing that comes to their mind is family and giving, giving of what they have to one another. It's not big gifts. It's not expensive gifts. It's just giving to one another. So spending time with one another, making sure that there's plenty of food, having an opportunity to relax and to enjoy one another. These issues, these points are so important to the African-American community, primarily because of the institution of slavery that went on for over 250 years in this country. And in that time period, as Africans were evolving into African-Americans, they they experienced through you know the lens of slavery they experienced america and and slaveholders especially in the what we call the antebellum period so from about 1800 to 8 to the you know end of the civil war in 1865 that time period um slaveholders would um have a day or in some cases a week where enslaved people didn't have to work and that's why Frederick Douglass really saw Christmas as something, as the work of the devil. Mm. Because he said it's in that time period that people look forward for the first time in a year, they would have plenty to eat. They wouldn't have to work that day or that week. They could get as much food drink as possible, and Douglas wow. complained, and keep in mind, Douglas was not in the South. He was in Maryland. He was in Baltimore for part of his life, and in the surrounding community of Mar- uh, outside of Baltimore in the rural community. He saw how slaveholders would make sure and encourage black people to drink as much as possible, those adults, uh, to just get drunk, drunk. Um, and they were seeing that as something good, although if you were industrious, you could work, you could earn some extra money, which the slaveholders did and didn't want them to do. Um, because if they did that, they were seen as industrious. And so they wanted to encourage, you know, the, another um, kind of behavior in African Americans so that it would keep them um, uh, uh, more uh, comfortable, in a sense, with their condition as opposed to wanting to rise up and rebel. And in fact, there were slaveholders in the Lower South who really didn't want to celebrate Christmas at all because they believed that that helped to create an environment of rebellion. And there were some rebellions that happened during that time where you had some people like uh, this 
popular, famous abolitionist named Henry Bibb, who eventually went up to Canada, and he was involved with the Underground Railroad. He chose to escape on Christmas because that was the one day that a lot of these, what they call patty rollers, which is, you know, people, uh, 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 night riders, they're always looking for escaped slaves. They weren't out there. And so slaveholders were afraid that that day, that one day where nobody was working, would be a day that enslaved people would take advantage of. And so for so many African Americans, the idea of finally, finally, after a whole year, getting a new set of clothes... Now, by new set, we're talking about a coat, a pair of of shoes, maybe, only for adults, uh, a dress for a woman, uh, pants and a shirt for men. One. One per year. That's all you got. And, and the slaveholders would act like that was a gift they were giving to enslaved people. And... And this was the one day out of the year where you actually could get enough food uh, to get full off of. Most enslaved people were barely fed. Many of them were very, very thin and gaunt um, when uh, the war got started and we started to see Union forces um, liberating them. Uh, because they worked them, literally they worked them to death in so many places. And and so Christmas was, for African Americans, was a time of relaxation. That You had an opportunity to be with your family. You had an opportunity to eat as much food as you want and to celebrate. And that's why for so many African Americans, even today, You don't just have a little bit of food. You have a lot of food. The list just goes on and on. And the celebration doesn't stop after uh, Christmas Day. In fact, sometimes it's before Christmas and long after Christmas because those that's what had so much meaning for African Americans after a, a year of horror. You know, we were talking about COVID before. Out of a year of horror, you now have an opportunity to be with your family, to eat until you're full, and to just relax. And so that one thing continued to be very important to African Americans. Not so much the celebration of Jesus' birth, that would be later, but the celebration of family and of love and of, of joy, just pure joy. And that's why so many African-American films about Christmas actually focus more on that than they do on the birth of Jesus. Awesome. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I say it all the time. You know, we could talk for, for hours and hours and days, as we as we have done in the past for many years, about the history of our people and the progress. But as always, I want to thank you so much, you know, for giving us your, your time, but more importantly, your knowledge as it relates to this. And we look forward to seeing more and experiencing more of your research as it relates to your new position of the new endowed professor of black of Virginia black history and culture. Before we go, we only have 30 seconds here. If you could give us your most memorable Christmas moment. Um, <laughs> well, I'll put you on the spot. my brothers and I grew up believing in Santa Claus. And so <laughs> one of the things that, that my brothers and I would do is wait at the top of the steps until my parents had set up the room for us to come and see. And that moment when you've got the Christmas tree, you have your family around, and you're seeing your gifts around the tree, that I will always remember that. That's my favorite (laughs) Christmas moment. That's it. That's it. You know what? (laughs) Many of us have those moments. And for those of you that are listening, once again, we want to wish you a merry, merry Christmas. Have a wonderful time with your family. Listen, you made it to the end of the year. This is a joyous occasion. It's Sunday. Those of you that are worshiping today, make sure uh, you enjoy your time with your church family. And listen, it was a great year. As we say always, be great, go out and do good things, and God bless, and we will see you on in the new year. Be safe. God bless. Be safe. God bless. Be safe.